Now, this book that we see in Revelation 6 1, there has been a lot of debate over what is this book. And I kind of take the position of <laughs> a couple of different positions kind of put together because it's what makes sense to me. I see in Daniel 12, if it's not this exact book, I think this represents the the closing of what we call the Old Testament. Right. And so basically, I think when when the sealing of the Old Testament happened, there's there's all these loose end prophecies with Malachi, what we say the last book, Malachi, the Hebrews would have Second Chronicles because their order is a little different and they combine some books. But for, for our purposes today, the Old Testament closes in Malachi and there's all these loose ends and these prophecies. And I think what God is saying is in the Old Testament, we see a promised Messiah to still come. We see judgment that's promised on Israel that's yet future. We have all these things yet future, and so he seals it. In other words, it's not open to interpretation where somebody could come and say, I think I will be the one to open the New Test- Old Testament back up, then I'm going to start fulfilling these because I'm going to take over where God left off. No, no man, no man is able to reopen the Old Testament and just start. When God hits pause on it, he put his seal on it, and only he then, when we, when we say seal, please don't think of like a DuPont, you know, decking seal. Like we put, no water can get to my boards because I'm sealing it. No, we're talking about a king signet seal, like a wax ring seal. It's the seal of royal authority. And so God is the one that seals that thing. In other words, what he's saying is I'm the only one that can open it. And so he is hitting unpause now in Revelation 6.1, and that's what John is seeing. So let's go ahead and go to Revelation 6.1. So the one who is able to loose the seals is also the one who is able to perform the judgments. You're basically saying, I'm authorized to open the scroll and unloose these seals, and I then also am authorized to pour out these judgments to make them so. So that's what we saw in chapter five. And let's go ahead and dive into chapter six. Oh, just as a reminder, Jimmy, of where we're at in our overall, we're in chapter six today. Remember our preamble basically means this is who I am, God speaking. This is who I am. Historical says this is, this is how we got to this point. And we're right here in our study. The ethical is basically saying ethical stipulations is saying, this is the ideal scenario. This is, this is what I want you to know. And we're in sections four through seven. Now we've already touched Every single letter had an ethical stipulation section in it. So they already have direct information of things that God wants them to do. But also in four through seven, we're seeing this picture. We're seeing this picture that although the world may seem like it's falling apart, it is not because in this case, the ethical stipulations is for you to accept and to know that Christ is on his throne that the Lamb of God has ascended and he is absolutely in charge. So the expectation for them is to rest in the fact that the the Lamb of God is in charge of all things. And that's what's expected of them in the ethical stipulations in 4 through 7. So that's where we are in our study so far. Let's go ahead and dive into Revelation 6 and verse number 1. John says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals... And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. Now, we've already kind of talked about it so far, but Daniel chapter 12, 9 through 11, we're talking about that sealed. So now we're taking that scroll and the lamb opens one of the seals. Uh, When the lamb opened one of the seals, I heard, as it were, a noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. Now, I'll, I will just tell you this. this the Greek in this, uh, Jimmy, is very interesting. And I don't want to get into Greek because no one probably cares and it gets a little too far in the weeds. But I will say this. The phrase come and see is very interesting because uh, it's very uncertain who that's talking to. It seems like it's talking to John, but it's very probable that actually, and I kind of lean this way, although it's not something I'd fight over. But it sounds like the the come is actually talking to the horse, the the rider on the horses and the horse. And so here, when one of the seals are broken, it seems like the instructions actually, because John's already looking. We already know that from chapter four. Uh, After this, I looked. So we already know John, John, they have John's attention. 
So the, the come is, is almost more talking to the horse. It makes more sense to me that way. I won't get into the technical um, syntax of the Greek, but anyway, it's just interesting. Verse number two, and I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, this is, uh, this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. We're just going to have some fun here. Let me, let me give you the overall idea of, I'm sorry, this is a little jumbled, but this is what we have to work with. We have the four horses here, white, red, black, and pale. And I have the number of the seals. Sorry, I thought about it after I wrote it. The first, the second, the third, the fourth seal. And we, of course, we have the fifth and the sixth down here. But our four horses, sometimes called the four horsemen of the apocalypse, so the question that everybody wants to know is who's the rider on the white horse? I mean, this is like the million dollar question. You know, um, when I was a dispensationalist, I would always teach that's the Antichrist. Um, you know, some um, some preterists will say, well, that's clearly Jesus. And, and here, I think the answer is much more simple than that. This is a vision. So this is a representation of an idea. This isn't like you can't, I don't think, you can attribute a person to this. This is an idea. This is a concept and a vision. And so very plainly here, the white horse is represent, re representative of the concept of conquering. And he was given a bow and he was given a crown. Now, I think, Jimmy, that actually you can see Jesus and Jesus's prophecies in all four of these writers, all four of them. You say, well, some of them are negative. How could they all four be Jesus? I'm not saying they all are Jesus. I'm saying they are representative of Jesus's actions. Please get this through the Roman, through the Roman army. See, remember, Jesus is the one that's chastising and punishing, um, sentencing along with the judgment of out of covenant Israel. And he's using the Roman army as his paddle, so to speak. You know, if he's spanking them, his paddle is the Roman army. So all of these are concepts, and behind all of these concepts is none other than Jesus. So I don't have to say whether this writer is Jesus or not. All I have to say is that Jesus is behind the Roman army, and this is representative of all of what's happening in that judgment. So I'm just trying to make it very simple, and, and that's how I see it. If people want to really get nitty-gritty on that, I don't think you can get more detailed uh, without taking things out of context. Now, very interestingly here, Jimmy, let's let's go ahead and read the specific wording on here. It says, I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow. Now, many people say that that bow is representative of a long, uh, a more of a lengthy sort of fighting uh, rather than a sword. A sword is up close, but a bow is sort of at a distance. You fight at a distance with a bow. So this initial writer, that this is initiating the judgment of God on Israel, and when we see the first century war, the Roman-Jewish war, we see that the Romans actually took all of Palestine, sort of surrounding, all the cities surrounding Jerusalem first. So they kind of came in and surrounded them first. And also something very interesting, and I don't know this to be fact, but I'll throw this out there because I think it's, it's very interesting. In verse number two, it says, a crown was given unto him. He went forth conquering and to conquer. Well, if we remember the story, Nero, Nero was in charge until he killed himself in, in uh, AD 68. Uh, in, in, in AD 68, he killed himself and then taking over for him is Vespasian. And the crown is then given to Vespasian. And then Vespasian's son, Titus, is sort of deputized. He's not an emperor at that point, but he's sort of deputized to finish the job, and he's given actual Jerusalem where he finishes. So we see sort of a passing of the baton of authority. And that's indicated in verse number two that we see uh, him that sat on him had a bow, but a crown was given unto him. And so potentially this passing of the crown can indicate that there's a shift in authority of Rome as they went forth to conquer. So we see in our first white horse that we see this idea of a for sure victory happening with the, with the aggression. And we see that this is, is it totally um, completely in line with the Roman army coming. Now, well, Jimmy, and wouldn't the, wouldn't the uh, emperor probably always ride a white horse, you know, the leader, Everything are, I've ever seen, it seems like they're riding a white horse. 
Well, and it's even deeper than that. And I, it's so difficult for me in, in our in our studies to know how how deep to go because our videos would be you know five six seven hours. Some of some of you would 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 like that. You like these deep <laughs> studies, but 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 white was actually a very significant color to the emperors, um, the Roman emperors, and that did that was something that they would that they actually did ride on was they found the starkest white horse they can. And so when people would see them coming and the whitest horse would be indicant, it'd be kind of like when we see um, streets shut down and we see helicopters and we see a black motorcade going and there's 60 and we're like, oh, the president's in town. Like that's, you know, when the president is near you and you see all these streets are shut down, all these motorcycle cops and everything. Yeah. Uh, that would kind of be like a white horse coming through for them. They'd have people surrounding them and that white one would indicate who they were. Um, but that's more of getting into history and not, not really the Bible. But yes, that was what they were known for historically. Jimmy, I want to say before we get going, for those of you who have been joining us since we started in Matthew 24 on this, I want to congratulate you for hanging in there because I believe today's the day. And I, you know, because Jimmy, we're going through this thing in order. Um, you, how in the world do you take a hundred hours of teaching and, and try to promise somebody at the beginning of, Hey, in a hundred hours, if you hang with us, you'll learn things that will change your life forever. You can't do that because people, people need to go through all the teaching and learn for themselves. But I'm here to tell you, if you're still with us and you went through the Matthew 24 teaching, I think today's the day that things will start to click together. And in this teaching, you're going to see things that I believe it's because of the teaching today, I could never, ever, ever go back to see the book of Revelation as anything different than what we're teaching. I'm fine with being wrong on some of the details or maybe cleaning up the way that I'm presenting it um, in my understanding on some small things. But as far as understanding this being as God's judgment, covenant lawsuit to first century Israel, I can't ever go back from that. And I want to show you guys why. If you were with us for our Matthew 24 study, then all of that teaching is about to pay off, okay? Because I want you to see that you have the, we call, remember Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13 are all sometimes referred to as the little apocalypse. Why? <laughs> Why? Because they contain all of the elements of the book of Revelation. And so if you were to take Revelation and squeeze it down, you would walk away with Matthew 24 or a parallel, Luke 21, or another parallel, Mark 13. And I want to show you a side-by-side. -side. There's a guy named R.H. Charles that put this together. Revelation 6, which is what we're in today, you're going to see in verses 1 and 2 about war, 3 and 4 about nation versus nation, 5 and 6 is going to be about famine, 7 and 8 is about pestilence, 9 through 11 is about persecution, and 12 through 17 is decreation. By decreation, we mean um, the opposite of creation. So when you're, in other words, you see creation being destroyed is decreation. You know, the sun being darkened, the stars fall into the ground, the earthquakes happening, the mountains being moved out of their place, decreation language. Remember in Matthew 24, and you know what? I see that. And sometimes I see, I misspell things. And I don't see it until I see it uploaded. I'm going to create, I'm going to correct that right now. Um, let's do that. But in Matthew 24, we, this is what we see, Jimmy. War, verse 6. Nation versus nation, 7a. That's the first part of the verse. Famine, 7b. Earthquake, 7c. Persecutions, 9 through 13. And decreation, 15 through 31. Very, very similar here. In fact, the only thing that's kind of out of order, earthquakes, pestilence. Other than that, we see the exact same information. So here's what I'm saying, Jimmy. If, if, our, if our Matthew 24 study was persuasive for you. If we did a sufficient job going verse by verse and showing in context from Matthew 21, 22, 23, that Jesus was saying, this is the generation that's going to receive all of the bloodshed that was spilled from righteous Abel to Zacharias, the son of Berechiah, is coming on this generation. Disciples, here's what I want you to look for. You will see these things. And when you see these things, I want you to do this a very local um, answer to this local problem. I want you to go here when this happens. If we were convincing in that, then Jimmy, Revelation 6 is, is basically retelling of Matthew 24. 
Okay. So if, if we were convincing in Matthew 24 in our, in our timing, then Revelation 6 is a dating technique because it's the same time period. Right. It, it would be just like if you, were, you know, if you found an old picture of yourself and you knew exactly when it was because there, there was a cake in front of you and it said, it said happy 10th birthday, young Jimmy. And we're like, oh, that's your 10th birthday party. You're like, yeah, I remember that friend came to that party and this friend came to that party. And yeah, look at the clothes I was wearing and look, the calendar in the background says the year and the cake says 10th birthday. Yeah, that's, that's my 10th birthday party. You've got all this evidence for the dating of that, that picture. And then there's a picture right next to it that doesn't have a date on it, but you're wearing the exact same clothes. All the same people in the picture are wearing the same clothes and they're still right next to you. And the things that you open for your birthday, you see that you're playing with in that picture. You can date the second picture with the first one, <laughs> right? right? And right. that and that's what we're doing with Matthew 24. Jesus is looking at the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. Those are the four he's talking to. And he's saying to them, when you guys see this, I want you to do this. This is going to happen. It's coming on this generation. All those same details. <laughs> it's exactly the same information. So Revelation 6, here's an outline of Revelation 6. There's 17 verses in Revelation 6. It's the exact same information as Matthew 24, 6 through 31. And so we're really, we're really getting all this information in the book of Revelation. So when we talked about earlier, Jimmy, that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in those three, you see the little apocalypse, the Olivet Discourse, or his talk on the Mount of Olives. But when you get to John... It's not there anymore. Why? We've talked about this before. Because John wrote Revelation. John's version of the a little apocalypse is the apocalypse, the revealing. And, and by the way, to show you how absolutely skewed we've been on this, the word apocalypse is the word revelation. And you, when we hear of apocalypse, we think of Mad Max. We think of every man for himself, a bunker in the cellar, canned goods, apocalypse time. It's apocalyptic. The word, the word apocalypse means reveal. It means you're learning who Jesus is. Yeah, let me let me ask you. I just had this thought as you said that. Okay, so why is it called the little apocalypse? Is it just because it's a short version yep. of the long thing? And if so, do the people who call that the little apocalypse, do they think that or do they attribute that to eighty seventy? But then Revelation to the end of all time, because mm -hmm. there's if if it's the little <laughs> apocalypse and Revelation is the big apocalypse, wouldn't that just mean a shorter version of the longer story, or or are they saying these are two different events, or are they just saying Jesus's little apocalypse was still about <laughs> the end of the world? Well, I can only answer for myself and the the people that I was raised with that were very adamant about this. I was a dispensationalist futurist. We believe that the all of it discourse was about the future. So we were consistent in that we did call Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. I did teach that as the little apocalypse. And I did teach it as a convent, a condensed version of, of the book of revelation. Okay. Because it's, it's undeniable. I mean, re you'll see today in revelation uh, six, it's basically the exact same wording. It, it, it's the same information. I was consistent, and because I was consistent and I saw Revelation as the future, I saw Matthew 24 as the future. Right. I, you, you ha I, I think you have to be consistent with it. And you say, well, how did I get around that? Well, first of all, I, I had never really studied it for myself. That's just what I was taught. Yeah. But here's the, here's the hook if you want to know wow, Ken, how could you have taken Matthew 24 as future when he's talking to Peter, James, Andrew, um, and John? And he said, when you guys see these things in this generation, very simple. Here's how I did it. I ignored that. And when anybody asked me, what about the audience? This is the patented answer. I was taught this in Bible college. Here's what you say. Well, Matthew 24, since the church had not been started yet, Matthew 24 shows these four men as representative of the nation of Israel. Wow. That's what I was taught. That's how I said it. That's how I taught it. So when the church got started, which I don't even use that terminology anymore because the church was already going, it's just that Jesus took it over because that, anyway, I don't want to rabbit trail there. 
But yeah, so these guys were representative of Israel, and then the church kind of interrupted their plans and started a great parentheses or a parenthetical time period of the church. And then God hit pause on what he was teaching in Matthew 24, and he'll hit unpause after the rapture. I see the church. That's how I taught it. The church is always messing things up. (laughs) <laughs> at least that version of it. It just doesn't in reality, but that's how it was taught. Well, you know, Matthew 24 wasn't still in their future, and maybe the, because it reads sure. that way, that's why a lot of people just attribute it to all of our future, I guess. I don't know. It just depends on where you put the church at and what your understanding of the church is. Yeah. You know, the dis- I don't want to rabbit trail too far. The dispensationalists see two kingdoms, two brides. I mean, so— they're only focusing on one at a time. Gotcha. So they see a whole nother thing. And that's why people want to send all their money to Israel today. They think the the kingdom of God is, has to funnel through Israel. And they see these, uh, this mo- one of the most um, uh, ungodly nations on the planet is the nation of Israel today. This The political state of Israel is maybe the most unchristlike nation on the planet. I mean, um, people can look into that on their own. Um, it is the Mecca for homosexuality. They they are not friends to the Christians, let me just tell you that much. Well, it's highly atheist, too, I think. No, absolutely. They, they aren't even Orthodox Old Testament. They, they don't follow that at all. Yeah, I think a, Talmud. a very small portion of people that are Israelis don't even, uh, they're not even practicing any kind of oh, religion. No. Not biblical, because yeah. biblical, biblical Judaism died in AD 70 because there's no temple. Right. Everything flows through the temple. Right. <laughs> and so for the last 2000 years, if you were a, a, a well-meaning, kind-hearted biblical Jew and you're like, I just want to practice like Abraham did, you can. You can. And you haven't been able to for 2000 years. That's why it's a history changing event that says there's never been one like it never will be. It's over. Biblical Judaism died in the first century. Yeah. You can still meet Jews, but they changed biblical Judaism, in other words, with the high priest, sacrificial system, temple, to rabbinical Judaism, and they changed all of the meanings to mean something else, and they started something new in the first century. And they had to, because yeah. it ended. Yeah, for those of you that have would like more details about that, we did do an episode uh, explaining biblical Israel, so I'll put a link to that. You should go watch it. If you like this video, hit that like and subscribe button and check out the full episode by clicking the link below.